Welcome to the Jericho Force Podcast, where we learn how to integrate faith into the work that we do. Don't conform to the world's way of doing business. Transform by doing business God's way. Here's our host, my husband, author, speaker, teacher, encourager, and stewardship coach, Jason Davis. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Jason Davis, a.k.a. Mr. Fortify, and I am your host of the Jericho Force podcast. And here on the Jericho Force podcast, we talk about how we integrate faith into the work that we do. I say this every single week. I'm excited for each and every single one of our guests, and that is no different today as I've got someone, I'm a big fan of his books. He's a great man of the kingdom. But before I bring him on, let me introduce him to you. He is an author, a speaker, and the founder of Christian Money Solutions. His name is Mr. Art Rayner. Art, it's an honor to have you here on the Jericho Force podcast. Jason, it is it is my pleasure to uh, to, to join you on on this podcast. And you know, anytime that that I get the invitation to be able to talk about something that I'm passionate about. Um, it's especially on a podcast like this one, mm-hmm. uh, the answer is yes. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to come onto your podcast to talk to your, your audience. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> Art, speaking of passion, as you know this, because you, you've studied quite a bit, you're a student of the word, just really giving people an overarching view of what the Bible says about money, and there's over 2,000 verses in the Bible on money and possession. So Art, can we just start there? Because I think some people, they know that, some people don't, some people are kind of in between. Why should we care about what God says about money? Man, I thought you were going to ask me to go through all 2,000 oh, plus no. of those, those verses. I was like, oh, no, I, I know some of them. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right. God has woven over 2000 verses about money, possession, stewardship throughout scripture. Jesus spoke on money more than any other topic while he was on, on earth. Needless to say, God has a lot to say about this topic of, of finances. And the reason becomes clear when you start looking at the scriptures, because when you talk about money, God really just talks about money in a vacuum. It's always tied to our hearts. Mm-hmm. See, money management often reflects heart management. And so when he's talking about money, he's really talking about our our hearts. And so, yes, he has woven um, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit, of, quite a few principles, quite a few guidelines, instructions on how we are to manage our finances for, for his glory. Mm, love that art. As we step into this art, there's that word stewardship, and it's a nice yeah. ten, twenty dollar word that for <laughs> some art it, it could be intimidating, and for others, their mind immediately goes to, oh, that's like a church giving thing. So kind of just uh give us that foundational piece of, well, there's a little bit more going on there with that word, but also it's it's simpler than what we think it is as well. Yeah, or or some just you know they immediately start falling asleep when they hear the, the term stewardship. It sounds like a, a boring word, right? Um, uh, let, let me go to the the parable of the of the talents mm-hmm. to talk about what stewardship is. So in the parable of the talents, we find a master who gives his servants um, some talents, which are you know, which is money, and to one he gives five, the other two, the other other one, and. And so what he then does is he leaves. The Bible tells us that he goes on a journey for a long time, and then he eventually comes back. Now, when he comes back, the servant that he gave five had earned five more. He gave it to the return to the master. He said, uh, see, you gave me five. Here's five more. The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Same thing happens with the one he had gave two. Uh, two. So he doubles the, 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 the talent. So the master gave two. The servant comes back and says, you gave me two, I gave two more, so see, here. And uh, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. The one who uh, the master gave uh, one talent to, he says, master, I knew you're a hard and uh, difficult master, which is funny because as you read the the master's response to the other servants, it's like, that doesn't really seem like a very difficult, harsh master. seems like he's ready to bless the uh, the, the servants, but he says, "I, I buried it in the back. And and so I just took it, buried it in the back, 
But you see, I, I have exactly what you what you gave me. Now, that was the one that was actually condemned. So what does that um, very, very brief overview of the of the parable uh, tell us? Well, one, it tells us that God is the owner. So God is the, the master in that in that in that story. Uh, Psalm 24, 1 tells us that God you know, owns everything. Everything is is his. He is mm -hmm. the creator. So he owns everything. He is the he's the owner, and we in turn are the are the managers. We are the 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 servants. Now, what often happens with us is when we have these possessions, when we have money, we look at it and we say, "Ah, it's it's, it's mine." You see, it's in my bank account. I earned it. But what Scripture tells us is that it's not ours. It's never been ours. It's all it's all His. Uh, let me give a, a quick quick example. Um, so I, I used to work at, I want to say I used to work, this is like my very first job. Uh, I worked at a go-kart track and putt-putt course called The Park. Uh -huh. and, and I was 15, very first place that I, that I worked, and it was a summer job that I, that I had. My role at The Park was to um, work with the go-kart. So I was the person that got people in the go-kart, got people out of the go-kart, and, and that's, what, that's what I did. And now, as the summer progressed, I learned everything that there was to know about those go-karts that were under my my watch. I knew which one was going to be the fastest on the track. And so if I liked you, you were going in that one. I knew which one was going to be the slowest. And so if I didn't like you, then you were going in that one. Now, I knew which one by the end of the day was probably going to have some type of engine issue. I knew everything about those go-karts. Now, let me ask you a question, though. At any point during that summer, did those go-karts <coughs> become mine? No, of course not. They were always the owners, even though I knew everything about them, even though they were in my possession, they were never mine. I was <coughs> only to do what the owner had asked me to do with those those, those go-karts. I was to do them, I was to, to make sure that I followed his purpose, his plan for those, for those go-karts. So in the parable of the talents, we find that the exact same thing going on, that a transfer of possession going from one hand to the next is not necessarily equal a transfer of ownership. There's a major difference there. So even while it's in our hands, we are still, uh, it's, it's still not ours. And we are to do with the master what God wants us to do to follow his plan and purpose. And that is, is stewardship. Now, it's not boring at all. So when you look at this parable, we, we find something. We find that when the master returned, that he came back to greater wealth than when he uh, than when he we had left. Mm -hmm. So because the what what the because of what the servants had had done, and so that gives us a uh, some kind of a guiding um, path, a direction for us uh, in the area of stewardship. We're not to steward. Stewardship does not mean just simply managing and doing nothing. In fact, that's who was condemned mm -hmm. in in this story. It wasn't that the one with one went off and spent it. He wasn't a prodigal son. He wasn't He wasn't any of that. He returned exactly what he had been given, and that's what he was condemned for. for. And so we are to use our resources, not to just kind of manage them well. You know, that's boring. We are to use our resources for the advancement of his kingdom, to expand, you know, essentially the master's wealth. Right now, God wants to get the owner of everything. So what is he really after? He's after hearts. He's mm -hmm. after He's after people. He wants people to know him as their Lord and Savior. And so we are to leverage our resources for the advancement of his kingdom. Leverage our resources in a way, certainly to take care of our needs, but also so that more people can hear the hear the gospel. Absolutely love that art, and that'll preach, man. <laughs> that'll preach. <laughs> you know, there's one key thing. Every time I read the parable of the talents art, I keep coming back to that one talent servant. And yeah. The Bible doesn't really comment. We can infer, but the Bible doesn't really comment on the nature of the relationship between the, the servants, except for that the one talent servant, he knew him to be a hard man. And like you said, you alluded to this earlier. It's like, oh, you know, we have the luxury of reading this 2000 years later. Yeah. But yeah. like, as, as I'm reading that, it's like, wow, like, how did he arrive? Like that, that's a question I always ask myself, man, how did he arrive at that? And that similarly for for us in, in 2022 modern day, how do we arrive relationally that way with the possessions and the money that we have, which really has been entrusted to us? So just give give us your thoughts 
on that. Because like I said, it's not much written, but it, it's powerful that it's right there in the text. Like, yeah, I need you to be a hard man. And relationally, because I viewed you that way, I acted accordingly. So I, that just always jumps out to me. Just your thoughts on it. Yeah. I don't know if he actually – this is me presuming on, on sure. something here. I I question whether he actually thought that he was a, a harsh uh, manager hmm. um, because even as the, the – or a harsh master because even as the master says, well, if you really thought that, then you would have at least put it in the bank so that I could have could have earned, earned interest. If you knew that that's how I operated, then – and so I, I – I don't. I don't want to assume that I know exactly what was going through that that servant's um, sure. mind. Other than uh, he decided not to not to do his master's will. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's once again. If if you really knew that the master was harsh, then why would he not follow through with what the master had asked him to to do, which was clearly not what he had what he had done. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, that's, that's re- maybe retwe- reading between the lines and maybe a little bit too much, but it sounds mm-hmm. more like a more like a human excuse, right. like hey, I, I knew th- I knew who you were, so therefore I, I did this, as opposed to re- I think he just realized, oh, I should have done something because this was at the moment of judgment. Gotcha. He's like, oh, I should have done something, uh, but I didn't, and mm-hmm. so I got to come up with something here, mm-hmm. with some with some type of some type of excuse, and that was the excuse that that he gave. Um, and so once again, I, maybe maybe I should, should take it a little more literally there, uh, with what he with what came out of his his mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems like it was more of a, just a, a lack of care, lack of concern, mm-hmm. laziness. Maybe he was not expecting the master to actually return because he had been gone for a long time. And then once again, when when judgment arrived, he was just scrambling trying to f- come up with some type of excuse, and that was the excuse that that he gave. Right. And I, yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the passage there. And, and the, but Art, you hit the heart of it, which was just didn't do the master's will. And I think yeah. that's the conviction part, uh, Art, that, um, that certainly I know for me when I look at that is like, wow, like even as you're just explaining that, even not, well, you know, what was going through his head? Just practically speaking, the art, like how often do we find ourselves, you know, apathetic or yes. lazy or I just want to do what I want to do or, oh, uh, you asked me a question. I just gave you an excuse in the moment. How do you think that mm, attitude influences how we handle our resources? Yeah, I, I certainly think complacency. Um, I, I think a few things um, lend ourselves to becoming that the the servant who, with with one. I think complacency is 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 a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we we just we we never think that ju- that judgment day will actually come for us. Um, as Americans, we're constantly pushing off that idea that death will happen to each and every and every one of us, mm-hmm. and so. We, we're thinking that that's something maybe far off. That that's something that just that's not gonna not gonna happen to to us, or at least even though we intellectually may know that we don't we don't feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, so complacency sh- could be one of them. The other thing for us as Americans is that we actually think that that we're the owner, that this stuff is actually our stuff. I think that's gonna be, that's another big issue that we that we face is that mm-hmm. there's a, a, an issue of mistaken identity mm-hmm. where we think that we are the the owner and therefore we should do with it whatever we we please and in our bank accounts when we when we look at it it should reflect our desires our purposes our plans as opposed to God's desires his purposes and in his plans and so i i think that a a, a lack of um, a, yeah complacency with with the master returning with the judgment actually happening, and then also this uh, this notion that this stuff isn't really our stuff. I think we really do struggle um, mm. with with that in in America. Got it. And you're absolutely right on that. Or you you make me think about um, different. Uh, mindsets, especially that society puts on us with peer pressure, you know, the you know, fear of missing out, FOMO is one. Yeah. Uh, YOLO, you only live once. And so when we, when we're, when we have that pressure, or what are some things that 
that we can do to uh, to put our mind back at, you know what, I know here's what society is saying, the materialism, the secularism, but how can I focus back? How can I put the focus back on what God wants me to do? And you, you hit the, the key to mistaken identity. So how can we take the focus off of what everybody else wants me to do back to on to what God wants me to do? Yeah, first of all, you have to have an eternal mindset. Mm. Um, you have to, to recognize that this this life that we live is just simply a, a blip, that it goes by so fast. And, and that, but at the same time, even though it's a blip, it has eternal ramifications. And that what we do in this life does matter. What we do with our resources actually actually matters, as once again, the parable of the talents uh, t- tells us, as many other verses in Scripture tell us. And so that's one thing, is you have to have an, an eternal internal mindset. Uh, you also have to have a heart for what Christ has a, has a heart for. You have, a, you have to have a heart for the lost. You have to, to recognize that there is a lost and dying world out there, and that God has given you resources to help reach those, those people. And and sometimes it's direct, other times it's more indirect as far as usage of those of those funds. But you have to have a heart for what Christ has a has a heart for. And the other is that you you need to have um, a a realistic view of the of the world. I, I talk about this a lot, especially with teenagers and young adults. You talk about the FOMO or the YOLO. What, it, one of the problems that we have in in our society is that it's it's well let me say it's not a new problem it's keeping up with the joneses mm-hmm. but it has um been expanded the joneses have been expanded almost to a global scale now so the the term keeping up with the joneses was originally introduced in 1913 with a comic book strip now when that was introduced it was literally talking about your next door neighbor or your coworker like it was the people that you saw every day and you were trying to keep up with their standard of, of living or at least their percept the perception that they had of their of their st- standard of living now because of social media we're not just looking at our our neighbors we're looking at our friends on on facebook we're looking at our friends on tiktok we're looking at people that we don't know Mm-hmm. And uh, and looking at them and saying, man, look at their lifestyle. But here's also the problem in addition to that. So we're looking at more people, but the lifestyles that we're looking at often aren't even real. So let me let me give you an, an example. Um, cars. People love love cars. Uh, they they love to put their um, their identity in cars. Like if I can drive this car, then I'm going to be viewed as as more successful. Mm. Or if I get in this, if I can drive drive this this kind of car, then I'm going to feel a certain way. And but look at the recent statistics on on new car purchases. So with new car purchases, 83 percent of those cars were financed, meaning that they either took out a loan or some type of lease to to get that car. Mm-hmm. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it's not that they could actually afford it in a way that most people act like they can afford it. Like they're 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 buying these car loans or they're getting into these car loans. Which, by the way, the most recent um, study showed that the average car loan payment new for new cars are is over seven hundred dollars. Fourteen percent of those car loans are over one thousand dollars per month. Jeez. The average term for a car loan is 70 months. So we're talking about not paying off this thing in years. Car loans are now going out or stretching out to 10 years. Right. Why is this happening? Well when you stretch out these car loans, it reduces the payment so people can get in these cars that they would not be able to afford otherwise. But then you're you're looking at these people and you're thinking, man, look at that car. Why did I mean how could they how can they drive that car? It's like yeah Look at that debt. That's mm-hmm. they got more statistically speaking. I'm not like you know judging them. Like I can't say that I know for sure, but statistically speaking, that brand new car that they're driving, they took out a, took on a load of debt for that for that car, or they leased it, so pretty much renting it. And and so we need to be aware of that. We need to put on our our lenses that help us see through the facade that that we're often looking at, whether it's on social media or even even beyond. That and so when you're talking about fear of missing out, YOLO, you got to have the eternal perspective. You got to have a you got to have a heart that 
that is driven by what drives Christ. Mm -hmm. And then also you have to have a a lens through which to view the world that breaks down that facade that everybody seems to be putting up right now. Mm. That's some wisdom right there, Art. (laughs) My goodness. Uh, Art, uh, you're going to be really familiar with this because it's one of one of the favorite things uh, of mine that you've said over the years. You give some of the most practical advice on just okay, how does it play out day to day with managing money? You say give generously, save wisely, live appropriately. How did you come up with that? And just where can people get started with just, it's like, man, that's so simple, but how do I kind of like, you know, is that all I got to do? Just, so where did you come up with that? And how does that play out for people day to day? Yeah, it's very simple. I didn't come up with it. God did. Um, So (laughs) I'm not going to take credit for that one bit. Those are just the principles that you find in scripture. Uh, As you, as you read those 2000 plus verses about money, stewardship, possessions, and and how we are to manage these things well, that's what you find in Scripture. We are to first give generously. You see that over and over in, in Scripture. Then we are to save wisely. So we're not talking about hoarding. Hoarding is putting your hope in, in, your, in your finances. Savings is, is uh, setting money aside for a specific future purpose. And that, according to the Scripture, is a wise thing to do. So we're going to give generously, save wisely, and then live appropriately, which is simply managing the rest uh, to certainly take care of your needs, but also to leverage those resources for the advancement of of his kingdom. And so those are the the principles that uh, we find in, in Scripture on a very basic level. Uh, those are the principles that are just as applicable to a five-year-old. We we do that. We we talk about it with our our five-year-old. We have give, save, live jars, um, but it's just as applicable to the to the ninety-year-old. Like if you do this, you're you're probably going to be okay. If you're able to give first, then set aside a little bit of money, and then and then live off the live off the rest, not living beyond. That your 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 means, then you're probably going to going to be okay. Now you you ask how how does how does somebody get started? Um, I I use something called the eight money milestones, and this was um, developed over over a few years. It has been inspired by by many many people. I can't say that I just came up with it on, on my own because you know we 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 stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And right. so <clears throat> this is certainly the case with the eight money milestones. Money milestone number one. Is to start is to start giving because that's where where scripture starts. Which, by the way, once again, the eight money milestones is simply a it's simply a guide. That that's all that it is. It's not necessarily not going to find it in scripture. It's not found in Matthew in anywhere. Uh, but it's just a, a basic financial financial guide. Uh, money milestone number two is to set aside fifteen hundred dollars for a minor emergency. Uh, get that. Um, this this isn't your your big emergency fund. This is your minor emergency fund. So when a car tire goes out or uh, your toilet overflows and messes up your, your floor. I have three boys. I can I can speak to that <laughs> multiple times. Um, so that's money milestone number two. Set aside $1,500. Money milestone number three is to make sure you get your company match. Money milestone mm-hmm. number four, pay off all your debt except for your mortgage. Money milestone number five, once you set aside uh, three to six months worth of living expenses, this is your big emergency fund. Mm-hmm. It's your job loss level emergency fund. Um it, <laughs> for for a while, people seemed to uh, to dismiss the idea of needing an emergency fund, but then the pandemic happened, yeah. and now everybody's saying you got to have an emergency fund. Uh, the next money milestone, money milestone number six, is to set aside fifteen percent of your gross—that's before tax income—for mm-hmm. retirement purposes. Now, that's not an Art Rainer number; that's uh, a number that was generated by the Boston College Center for Retirement Research. They looked at at Americans. They looked at Americans uh, Americans' finances, and they said fifteen percent for most people is is the right number. Now that doesn't mean that you, if you're getting closer to retirement, that you don't need to set aside more. You might. Uh, money milestone number number seven is to either save for college if you have children or or pay off your mortgage. Yes, you can do that. Believe it or not, I did that, and it's mm. awesome. Uh, and then money milestone number eight is to live generously, using your resources in a way that you never imagined uh, you could use them for the advancement of of God's kingdom. And so 
where do you get started? I would say there's a plan for you. It's going to be a plan that will work for for a lot of people. Um, it's not perfect. I'm not going to say it's the perfect plan, but it has worked already for a lot of people. So that's a good um, good guide for anybody who's looking to take that next step on their financial journey. Mm, thank you for that, Art. And Art, you have tons of resources. We'll get into uh, some of your books here in a second. But where could people find the eight money milestones? Yeah, they can just go to artrainer.com and click on the resources tab. And you'll find, it'll say milestones under under there. I couldn't quite fit eight money milestones. So it just <laughs> says milestones. You click on the milestones and you'll and you'll see it. Or if you happen to have any of the books that I, that I wrote, they're, they're in there as well. Love it. Love it. <clears throat> Art, you've, you're the author of multiple, multiple books. And I, I believe it was kind of during the pandemic, I think 2020, probably, uh, which was the most recent one. And unless you're working on something new, <laughs> but uh, find more money, increase your income to tackle debt, save wisely and live generously, uh, especially with what's happened over the last two and a half, three years. Just talk to us about the premise of that book. Yeah, the, the reality is that some people, uh, well, let me let me say most of the time when we talk about better in your financial health, we focus on the expense side of the financial equation, and, and understandably so. We need to reduce expenses, make sure we're not uh, spending more than we than we make. We focus on that expense side of the financial equation. However, there are times when you need to focus also on the income side of the of the financial equation. Um, I give you a quick story. So I'd finished speak. I'd finished speaking at a church, and the pastor comes up to me and says, "Hey, Art, I love your stuff." But here's my problem, because we don't have any debt. We don't really spend very much, um, but we're still still struggling to make mm -hmm. ends meet. What do you recommend? My suggestion was not that he needs to reduce his expenses even, even more. They already had a bare bones budget. My suggestion was to actually increase the, the income. And fortunately, we live in a day and age where that is now, it's just more possible than it, than it ever has been before uh, through various platforms that are already out there. You know, Uber's like the classic go-to. I know it's not as popular as it once was, but there's a number of different platforms out there where we can actually increase our income, even temporarily, to accomplish some of our financial goals. And I say temporarily because you, you might not have to once you get rid of the debt. You might not need to continue the uh, the side gig. You might not need to uh, continue it once you've set up your emergency fund. Um, and so it may be something that you can do temporarily to better your your financial situation. And and so that's just another tool in the tool belt to, to have. And that book walks a person through that particular journey, how to increase your income. It was just based on my own experiences um, as, uh, as somebody who had, has had multiple side gigs now. I was doing side gig gigging before I knew that that was a thing. <laughs> um, and then they put a term to it, side gig, side hustle. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've been doing that right. like for a long time. Let me just share with you what, what I've done and how I think through it. And, uh, you know, there's the book. Wow. Uh, Art, where can people grab a copy of that? Yeah, they can just go to christianbook.com or they can go to, to amazon.com. So it's available wherever wherever books are sold. Excellent. Folks, we'll have all of this in the show notes. So as Art is giving out all these wisdom-filled resources, don't worry. We'll have all of that listed. We'll have links to all his website and all the resources. Uh, Art, we're going to get to the to the uh, the heart of things here. You're the founder of Christian Money Solutions, and uh, you have uh, some really exciting things upcoming and something brand new. And I've been waiting to get to this point. There's been some buildup, but talk to us about the mission of Christian Money Solutions, and then get in, and then we'll get into the the brand new uh, financial counseling. Uh, area that uh, you've taken the wraps off of. So just talk to us about the your mission for your organization and then just the uh, the role that financial counseling can play and the opportunity that you're going after. Yeah, God's given me a uh, just a really um, incredible opportunity to take this step and to be able to to launch a, a company, um, Christian Money Solutions, as you've already said, is the name of the company. Um, 
the the mission is simply to help people discover and pursue God's design for for money. Um, that's it. Um, and we're going to do that, uh, Lord willing, through uh, through a variety of different different ways. Um, the first step that we took was with the certification program that you were that you that you've already mentioned. And I am really, really excited about about this program. So you can find it at Christian Financial Health. That's with a th at the end. dot com. And the the program is called the Certified Christian Financial Counselor Program, or CERT CFC for for short. I, I have uh, met many many people who have been looking for this type of, of, of program, uh, a program that was, is both rigorous from a financial standpoint, but also from a, from a biblical standpoint. Surprisingly, there was nothing out there um, to help train and equip men and women to help others discover and pursue God's design for money in this way, in the way that we're, in the way that, the, that this program does. And so the program offers over it's well it's 32 modules and in those in those modules you're going to um you're going to read a lot just to be to be frank um it's not an easy program which by the way I want to be clear this is not help you to get out of debt type type program this is you you know finances pretty well and you love helping people with their finances on the on a on a basic uh, I don't want to say on a on a basic level, but help people with budgeting, help people get out of debt, help people save money for for the future. You're not helping them uh, save for retirement. That's that's not you're not helping choose their investments. It's not that that type of program, but you're you're helping people in these areas while recognizing that you're not just dealing with financial issues. Oftentimes, you're dealing with heart issues, mm. and and so this program is geared toward toward that. Uh, you there's over uh, 30 plus uh, worksheets that a person can use if they have a private practice that they can go ahead and use those those worksheets. That's typically a hurdle for for many people when they're looking at financial counseling or wanting to do financial counseling. They're not sure what steps to to take, and so this this program answers answers those those questions. At the end of the program, there is an examination. The examination is it's 100 questions. It's a, about a two-hour exam, um, and and so if you pass that exam, then you receive your your certification, which is important. That that people who are, if you're dealing with somebody's finances, that there's some type of credentialing there, so that they know, hey, this is a person that I can that I can trust, and I can not only trust their financial acumen, I can trust the lens through which they're providing this this advice. I know that it's done through the lens of of scripture. And so my hope, my desire um, for this program, now granted, you could use this in a, in a private practice setting. You certainly could. Um, in fact, it's really geared toward toward that. That was the standard that we that we set. But my hope is that we have a CERT CFC in every church across America. Mm. And so, and, and maybe even doing it on a volunteer basis, maybe a staff person is probably not going to be, though, in most churches, so that when the pastor meets with a couple, meets with an individual, and they say, you know what, we're struggling with our finances. Um, we're loaded down with debt, and we're just not really sure what to do, what step we need to take. He can say, great. Hey, well, not great. You know, I'm not excited for you, but hey, I have a solution for you. I'm not going to be able to help you directly with that, but we have Jason. And Jason is a CERT CFC, and he has gone through the program so that he can help people just like just like you. Mm -hmm. And so then the pastor is able to recommend the that the person works with works with you. And and so that's what the that's what this program is. At least that's my heart for the for, for the program. Once again, I'm very excited about it. I'm excited um, uh, with the response that we've already received. I would love an army of men and women to to go through this program. There, there's just such a massive, massive need out there. I continue to get requests uh, from men and women saying, hey, and literally across the nation, um, hey, I need help. Can you recommend somebody? Can you, can you, and for a long time, I didn't really have an answer because I couldn't take them all on. Like I have my own clients that I, that I have. It's not a, it's not a big group. I can only take on so many, but hopefully we can get, Men and women across the nation who say yes, we have people that can that can meet with with you, 
and we can send them to those uh, to those search CFCs across across the nation. Mm. All right, I love your your heart and uh, <clears throat> just doing this and wanting to serve the the greater good. And also, you're like, hey, I can't do it all <laughs> by myself. And so here's a way for people that are passionate and have a desire to help uh, people and kind of take the next step, maybe not doing it uh, on a casual basis, but like you said, if they have a desire to to actually uh, have a practice. And then, like you said, the ultimate case that, hey, in every church, uh, we've got resources and we've got people, credentialed people to walk side by side uh, with uh, men and women, their families, uh, single or married. So that that's really awesome, Art. I definitely it, wish you the best on that and praise yeah, I, up for that, man. I, it, so uh, the way that I'd, uh, I'd liken it is the uh, you have a marriage counselor in your church. Mm-hmm. This would be your financial counselor in, gotcha. in your in your in your church. Um, some pastors have already said, "Hey, we're going to use this in our benevolence ministry, mm-hmm. so that when we." hand out funds to help cover utility bills or whatever that financial need may, may be. We have somebody then that they can actually meet with we ha- and, and help them better their financial situation. So they're not just simply giving uh, out, out money, but mm-hmm. we're also providing them a resource where they can learn how to better manage their, their money mo- moving forward. And so um, I would love to see more of that in, in churches because the need is certainly there. Mm-hmm. That's good, Art. Love that. Um, you know, Art, we're coming to the end of, <clears throat> we're, we're really at the end of 2022 and we're already looking ahead to 23. I can't believe how fast this year went. What are you excited about going into the new year and where do you think God is, is leading you next? Well, I, I am excited about everything that I just, that I just discussed with that certification program. Mm-hmm. I am, I'm, that's going to be my focus for, for a little while. I'm um, very excited about that. I do have another book that will release in 2023. Um, it is through through Tyndale, and it's all about generosity. It's called Money in Light of Eternity. And so I'm very excited about that. That will release in October, uh, I believe. I believe it's October of 2023. It's either September or October of 2023. So I'm looking forward to that. But right now, i um, excited about the, the certification program and helping others help others pursue and discover and pursue God's design for money. Hmm. That definitely sounds exciting, Art. And uh, I have most uh, things in in my library of yours, so (laughs) I I will look forward to grabbing a copy of that myself. But uh, Art, I just wanted to thank you for taking time out to come here on the podcast. You've given uh, in a short time period, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, uh, and inspiration and hope that wherever someone is right now in their, uh, faith and finance journey, that, uh, God is with them and like, Hey, you're not alone. And that resources are available. So Art, I just thank you for coming on the show today. Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode, it is a, is an honor. I'm very thankful that you reached out to me, uh, to be able to just simply allow for me to come on to your podcast and, and talk for a little bit. So so thank you. Cool. All right, we'll have to do this again sometime in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, folks, you know how we uh, leave things here on the Jericho Force podcast. Don't conform to the world's way of doing business. Transform by doing business God's way. We'll see you next time on the Jericho Force podcast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Jericho Force podcast. You can catch us live on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time and on demand. Check out JerichoForce.com backslash podcast for more details. To learn how to live out your faith in the marketplace, grab a copy of Jason Davis's book, Fortify, Being Rooted in God's Plan for Work and Business, available on Amazon. You are listening to Jerry Orsula Worldwide Podcast.